Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Back in our Father's Word, chapter 4, verse 12, the great book of Matthew. Uh, Christ beginning his ministry here in this fourth chapter, who was the first person he ministered to? Satan. In the wilderness, tempted 40 days. What does 40 stand uh, for numerically? It means temptation or probation. He was showing us how to get it done that you don't have to worry about Satan when you use Christ's name, when you use the power that he gives you in his name. And the main thing you want to remember, Satan quoted a lot of scripture. You know, there are many Christians that can't, they can't quote scripture like Satan did. The trouble was when Satan quoted scripture, he twisted it about right at the end, about 90 degrees, which made it a lie. So, that's why you have to be sharp and you have to know and have the M.O. of Satan, how he operates, and you'll never be deceived because you have the Savior and in his name you, you have control. You don't have to worry about it. So uh, Christ made that stand showing us the first person he ministered to, Satan, to show us how to get it done, how that you overcome the enemy and um, even after having fasted 40 days and 40 nights, which you cannot do, should not do, uh, he still defeated Satan, showing us uh, that Satan looks for your weak spots, and certainly he used hang hunger as part of this, but Christ still overcome. By what? By the Word of God. Let that be a lesson to you. I'll say it again. By the Word of God. He overcome, overcame that hunger. So let's pick it up today as he has put Satan behind him. And, um, and we pick it up in chapter 4, verse 12. It reads with the word of wisdom from our Father. Now, when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. Now, there is no such term in the Greek as cast in prison. It's delivered up. Okay. He was not yet put into prison because the disciples haven't even been called yet. So the time's not ripe for prison, but he was delivered up for a hearing, no doubt, before uh, Herod. Verse 13, and leaving Nazareth, um, he, I'm sorry, he, yes, uh, he, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, that's the house of Constellation, or the town of, city of Constellation, and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast in the borders of Zebulon and Naphtali. Uh, Zebulon, of course, being um, uh, habitation, and uh, Naphtali being uh, place of my wrestling. And verse 14, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, well, what did he say? What did, uh, what did that prophet say in um, Isaiah chapter 9 we, about these two, which we believe today is, uh, uh, makes up uh, Poland and Norway? They, they even claimed this. What does it say concerning them? That's where those tribes went. Chapter 9, the great book of Isaiah, verse 1. You won't have it, but listen to it carefully. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan <coughs> in Galilee of the nations, where this took place in Galilee, the circuit. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light, that they dwell in a land of the shadow of death, upon them hath that light shined. Bear in mind, you're in the Old Testament here, written 700 B.C. approximately. 
and laying out exactly what's happening in Christ's ministry. Skip on down to verse 6. What does it say there? For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And that being what our Lord and Savior is, got it written 700 years before. Verse 7 of the same chapter, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. It's eternal. Upon the throne of David and upon the kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And uh, so it is that our, our Father is strictly in control. The Old Testament inner we is interwoven considerably with the New Testament. Why? Because it's all the Word of God. And the fact that it was foretold that long before is to encourage you to know this Word is true. That when God warns you it's going to happen, you better get ready. That's, prop that's the way it's going to go down when you read with proper understanding. And now let's return back to chapter 4 of the great book of Matthew. Let's have the next verse, please. Verse 15. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. Uh, and certainly the great dikes and the sea and everything connected with these two nations. 16. The people which sat in darkness saw great light. And to them which sat in the region and the shadow of death, light is sprung up. So you don't have to be in that shadow of death and you don't have to fear death. The light has come. Christ has given us that eternal life. Christ heads our government, the government of Christianity. His kingdom, that's the king and his dominion, is wherever those Christians walk when they utilize that power and authority that he gives us. Verse 17, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, he was the king and the dominion, his dominion was earth and heaven, wheresoever he would choose to, to um, Turn this. What, what, what does this repent means to turn away from sin, turn away from that that is wrong, be strong, show the world that you can live in a, a just and a righteous way that is pleasing to that light whereby he can shine upon you and use you. Otherwise, he cannot. He cannot use somebody that is not disciplined and that does not walk in that light. Uh, verse 18. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon, that, that means hearing, called Peter, which is a rock, and Andrew, that's hearing, and his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. They, they, they were commercial fishermen. Verse 19, And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. In other words, that's that same analogy of how you catch fish is how you uh, snag or hook men and women into hearing truth by dropping and planting seeds. Uh, that word comes in. Verse 20, And they straightway left their nets and followed him. Now, I want you to see the election in this. Because he didn't throw up a tent or an arbor or anything else to hold a revival or a meeting. He didn't say, would you? He said, follow me. And I mean, they gave it all up and went with him immediately. They were called. They were chosen. That's why God's election has been since the beginning of time. That that remnant has always been that came forth with the word always bringing that real truth generation to generation forward, whereby people that had eyes to see and ears to hear 
would hear the true word of God. Uh, so, um, again, as it was, they, there was no revival. They recognized that voice and they followed him. Uh, he is the shepherd and his sheep know his voice. Have you heard it? Do you know his voice? Verse 21, and going on from thence, he saw two other two uh, two brethren, James the son of Zebedee. James is the uh, Greek form of Jacob, the supplanter, the heel grabber, and John, being Yahweh's gift, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee. And that's my gift, is what the word means. Their father, mending their nets, and he called them. 22, and they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. They're, they're um, again, the fishermen of glory here. We got four of them right here in a row. And again, no revival. Simply that statement, follow me. And, uh, and follow they did. 23, and Jesus went about all Galilee, meaning the circuit, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Now, he, he, he didn't just talk about it. He didn't pretend. He cut it. He got it done. No ifs, no ends, or maybes. And naturally, when healing of this uh, nature is taking place, it draws attention, and unfortunately, sometimes the wrong kind of attention because they come for the healing instead of the Word. Always remember, it is the Word that heals. It is Christ, for He is the living Word which does the healing. No preacher does. Uh, um, many doctors pr pr uh, practice uh, as physicians, and they have abilities to heal. But <clears throat> miracle healing takes place with Christ alone through our Father. Verse 24, And his fame went throughout all Syria. Naturally it would. And they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with divers diseases and torments and those which were possessed with devils. I want you to note that being possessed and being sick are two different things. And those which were lunatic, that's the worst kind. And those that had the palsy, that's paralyzed. And he healed them. Why would I say the lunatic is the worst? Because that's lunar, that's of the night. That's Satan's name. He is, uh, uh, he, all prophecy given concerning Satan is given in months, which is to say moons, uh, because he is the prince of the night whereas um, we have the prince of the day walking or, or as night as well, and that light. Why, why can you say at the night? Because the light sheds, uh, uh, destroys the darkness, and you're never in darkness when you have the light, regardless of what time of the day it is. Uh, it, again, I, I, it is important that you know in your own mind from the Scripture there is a difference in illness and being possessed. Unfortunately, many people who, let us say, that might have seizures because of maybe an injury at birth, you have some people will say, well, they have a demon. They do not. They're, they have an illness. This, this hurts Christianity when you have, if, if you do not have spiritual discernment to be able to recognize an evil spirit, when you see one, a possession, or an illness, then you have no business even uh, trying because um, you do not have that gift of discernment. It's very important. Uh, this, this, this harms, again, I want to say, when many people claim that, say, a person with seizures has evil spirits, that's, that's, that's hurtful and it's incorrect. Uh, and there are, or well, are there still devils today, which, well, really demons? Of course there are. It's called evil spirits in, in the manuscripts. 
There are evil spirits. There's not one behind every bush. But there are out there, and in Christ's name, you're able to dispel them and destroy them and send them where they belong. Christ gave us that power and that authority in the great book of Luke, chapter 12, verse 19. Forward. Verse 25 to continue. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee all around the circuit, and from Decapolis, that's, that's the ten, ten city uh, group, and from Jerusalem, and from Judea, and from beyond Jordan. I mean, with, um, why? Because he didn't just talk about healing. He didn't just have a meeting and talk about it. He, he was a doer. And with that word, he did heal those people. He did drive out the evil spirits. And um, naturally, that drew quite a crowd. His fame was uh, spreading rapidly. Chapter 5, verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. In other words, we're, we're pulled away now, and you, you always want to pay attention. Who is Christ talking to? That's called rightly dividing the Word of God. Was he talking to a multitude? Or was he talking to those that would teach? Because when, when he talks to those that would teach his disciples, you as a seed planter need to, to pay attention. Because it is a message that is given to you. Rarely will he speak in parables when he speaks alone to his disciples. But it does happen. Verse 2, And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Verse 3, Blessed are the poor. This word blessed uh, in the Greek would be even better translated happy. Happy are the poor in spirit. This word poor would translate humble. Ble happy are those that are humble in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You cannot have a prideful person and have him honestly blessed and happy. Um, with, with the Holy Spirit dwelling within him because when he humbles himself before God, he knows that Spirit is from God, the Holy Spirit, and it is the Spirit that accomplishes things, not the entity, for entities that um, begin to be prideful lose everything. I'll say that again. When you get prideful within yourself, that, that's, that's a bad thing. You must be humble and know that if you have a gift, it's from God. He gives that to you for a purpose. And if you do not use that gift for that purpose or in that way, then it's, uh, all gifts are given without repentance, as it's written in Romans 11. But um, our Father will correct those He loves in a tremendous way until they wake up and realize I'm gifted humbly, I'm to serve God. Verse 4, Blessed or happy are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. That is to say, blessed and happy are those that mourn when you see the lies and deception taught in this world to our people. You mourn when you see governments or anyone else that takes advantage of our people or belittles our Savior or that condemns those that would follow our Savior. You mourn about that. And you not, only, you not only mourn about it, you pray about it and do something about it. Verse 5, Blessed or happy are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are and happy are those that are not prideful, okay, but are humble, meek and humble knowing where the blessings come from, from our Father, not, not self. So uh, meekness means pride is just throwing in the trash can. You see, you want to be real careful. In Ezekiel chapter 28, Satan's downfall came. He, he was a fantastic cherubim at one time, elevated from the bottom basically all the way up to the cherubim that covereth, meaning he was right at the mercy seat covering it. 
And what, what caused that? Well, it's written in Ezekiel 28. Pride took him from within, and he fell and will be turned to ashes from within, which is a Hebrew idiom meaning fini. So pride is a dangerous thing. You want to keep that in control, always giving our Heavenly Father the credit. Just like Jesus himself in this ministry we're reading of now, it was he, not the disciples, that healed the sick. Disciples through Christ would, will many times have healed the sick, but it's always Christ that does it, okay? Verse six, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled. They're, they're, they're going to be, using a shepherd's term, they're going to be foddered. That's to say when you, you produce good fodder in the, uh, the uh, shepherd's field, the pasture, where that's what a pastor is, and it comes from pasture, is you provide fodder for, or truth from God's word to the people, whereby they are well fed. And what does it say here? Blessed are those that hungry and thirst for what? Truth, righteousness, wanting to do what's right. When you do that, God promises that you're blessed. God promises that you're happy. And that's where happiness comes from. And, and the real simple equation to that, if, if you were to use a little psychology, it's peace of mind. This brings the old flesh body peace of mind when you see God working in your family and in your body. You can't help but have, to have that peace of mind and with that comes peace forever. Or peace rather, control peace even within your own family. Why? Because you're blessed and you're happy. You're doing it God's way. Verse seven, blessed or happy or the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. This is to say compassion. I'm sure if you've heard me teach uh, very long, you've heard me say, I can always tell God's elect because they have great compassion. I'm talking about truly God's elect. They will always have compassion on God's children. And because they have that compassion, because they want to show mercy, that's to say love, um, a companionship to the brotherhood, then they're going to obtain mercy themselves. When you serve God, if you deserve it, you're going to get it. It's also when you serve God, if you need correction, you're going to get it. Okay. You always get what you got coming. You're going to get what you got coming to you from God if you love him and are following him because he specifically corrects those he loves. Because well, he's got a purpose for them. Just as he would call Peter and, and, um, and Andrew, follow me. No ifs, ands, or maybes. God has purposes and he has election that follow that. So w when you do show that compassion, you're going to receive compassion. Verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart. That's to say pure in mind. Why? Because you've got peace of mind. For they shall see God. That's uh, see him in what way? Well, spiritually, you're going to see him. He will, he will lead you. He will guide you. And God speaks in many wondrous ways to those that truly follow him. And, and, and so it is. That's why when, when you are pure in following him, in, in listening to him, in thirsting for his word, then certainly you're going to see him because he's going to use you. He's going to uh, speak to you one way or the other. It could be in a chain of events that transpire that you know you're needed and used. For a father always uses those with compassion. Verse 9, blessed or happy are the, uh, the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of God. Well, how, what does it mean, a peacemaker? It means one that can take the word of God and bring peace into the minds of people, giving them assurance. What? That's, we're talking eternal life. Contrary to death, 
the pit, Satan, hunger, fear, and pain. We're talking eternal life, and we're talking blessings in what you do. If you are pleasing to God, and, and you are a peacemaker for Him, I don't care what you set out to do, if it's what He wants you to do and He's pleased with it, He's going to bless it. That means you're going to be successful because you will have it, and it means God's gift to do whatever you're doing whereby it is profitable to God, not necessarily to you, but helps our Father, in, and um, that's why He can call you children of God because you work for Him. You serve Him, so naturally He's going to bless you. You can count on it. Verse 10, blessed or happy or they which are uh, persecuted for righteousness' sake. And I don't want you to read over that. A lot of people say, I was persecuted and I was thrown in prison for stealing money and this, that, and the other. Well, that's not for righteousness' sake, my friend. You were thrown in prison because you're a thief, okay? And you need to repent from that. But when you're persecuted simply for being a Christian, and it will happen, it will happen. When you teach the truth, there will be some will come along and, and counter and try to make light of what you believe and when you have that real truth. But you're, you're happy and blessed if you're persecuted for doing what is right. You don't have to worry about it. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That is, means you inherit the king and his dominion even in heaven. And it will be where is heaven ultimately here on earth. That's where Christ comes to with the heavenly father in in Revelation chapter 21, God establishes His kingdom right here on earth, nowhere else. And blessed are those that follow Him, that stay with Him, that suffer or are persecuted for doing what is right. Verse 11 to continue. Blessed are happy are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say, all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. For whose sake? For Christ's sake. When you teach the truth, there will be people say very bad things about you. And uh, is, is it painful? Of course not. Because those that matter know it's not true anyway. Those that matter know when, when an evil person is putting out a bunch of lies. You, it's, it's real easy to spot. But when you are accused falsely for Christ's sake, and when you teach the, God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, it is amazing at how you can stir some people's uh, 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 temper, being. Well, that's a little different than what uh, Grandpa told them. It doesn't really, it's wonderful that Grandpa told you something, but your real Father, Almighty God, speaks to you through the Word, not Grandpa necessarily. Maybe Grandpa, but most likely through the Word. At least if Grandpa tells you something and you can't find it in God's Word, you better be careful. So um, there it is, falsely for, it's got to be for Christ's sake. Not Grandpa's sake, not Grandma's sake, or not Aunt Molly, or anybody else. Okay, It's for God's Word. And when you shut yourself away to hear only God's Word as your judge, for He is the judge of all, then sometimes uh, it can cause friction, but that's fine. You'll still be happy when you do it God's way. Well, how could that possibly be? Because He's going to bless you. He's going to prosper you. And, and therefore, you can be happy. You will have it, okay? God, God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. But you have to be pure in mind, and you have to do it His way. No shortcuts. Verse 12, rejoice and be exceedingly glad, 
For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. It's not a new thing. To be persecuted for truth is a thing of old because of the, the, the um, trouble, the problem, the controversy between Satan and Almighty God. That, um, that controversy has caused much hurt. But praise God, when you serve him, he will, he will always see ultimately that you're blessed. You might even, persecution can be a little painful at times. But it'll only be painful if you let them get to you when you realize that you're serving God. And with a pure mind, you're fulfilling what He would have you do. Then you can rest assured blessings are coming. You don't have to worry about it. That's His promise. And He always, I do mean always, keeps His word. Uh, how precious it is. And, and like he's saying here, uh, prophets have uh, suffered from the beginning of time, but eternal life is good. But also, you don't have to wait for heaven to receive your blessings. He blesses those that serve him today, right now, when they do it with a pure mind and follow these beatitudes which we have covered here. It is one great beautiful thing. Verse 13 to continue. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt hath lost her savor, if, if it's lost its flavor, that is to say its saltiness, wherewith shall it be salted? It can't. If it's lost its saltiness, it's blah. Okay. It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot of men, dung in the street, as it would say in some places. So a person that is teaching God's word has got to be a little salty. That's what he's talking about. It's got to change lives. It's got to change the flavor. And to change that flavor, imagine this, mashed potatoes just out, I mean, mashed, and there they look so beautiful. They're not salted. You taste it, and blah, it's bland. Well, so is a preacher that's not salty. They're bland. So sprinkle the salt of God upon it and be salty. Make a difference. When, when, when you're salty, it can change lives and help people. A lot of people may not understand that, but that's fine. You're a child of God, and you know what he's talking about. Why? because you've got eyes to see and ears to hear. All right, don't miss the next lecture. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible is an invaluable tool to the serious Bible student. The Strong's Concordance lists every word used in the Bible and every passage where the word utilized may be found in the scriptures. With the assistance of a reference numbering system, the English reader may easily translate any word back to the original Hebrew, Chaldee, or Greek in which God's word was written. The Companion Bible is a unique study Bible. In addition to the text of the King James Version Bible, an extra wide margin contains a wealth of information not found in other Bibles. A system of structures or outlines employed by the Companion Bible will allow the readers to rightly divide the Bible. The use of these structures help the reader follow the subject matter and therefore they are critical to an understanding of God's Word. The 198 appendixes found in the Bible cover a wide variety of topics and information which will enlighten your studies. The Companion Bible and Strongest Concordance are a must for the serious Bible student. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, you submit it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We do not judge people. Why? Well, we have a judge. It's our Father. You have the right, a gift from God called spiritual discernment, to know whether you're hearing truth or, or falsehood. Therefore, you must decide that, but don't judge. And the truth is beautiful, absorb it. 
falsehood, throw it to the side. You don't need it. That's God's gift is to be able to do that. A lot of times we can just call that good old common sense and you'll go a long, long way. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. It's always a pleasure. Got a prayer request? Don't need that number, don't need an address. Why? Because God knows what you're thinking even. You don't even have to say it out loud. And why? because he, he created you the way you are, different than anyone else. Your DNA is different, fingerprints different. Why? He wanted somebody just like you, you're unique, but he wants you to love him. He is the closest relative you will ever have. So if you want to be blessed, let him know you love him. That's the main thing he wants. Hosea 6.6, 6, I don't want your burnt offerings. I want your mercy, your love. That's what he wants. So let him know. Once you do that, you make his day, and boy, will he make yours. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, question time. And we have um, a banalist uh, from Pennsylvania. I've never heard that as a name before. How many heavens are there? Um, th there are, there's only one heaven. Where people are mistakenly think there's more than one heaven is they do not read the manuscripts. For example, Second Peter chapter 3 says there are three heavens and three earth ages. But you have to know the difference between cosmos and eon. Eon is translated world, but it means age. So we have one heaven, one earth, but there are three different ages spoken of that pertain to you. The first earth age, this one, and the one to come. There, there is a very strong reason and purpose for each of those. And um, there you have it. Uh, it. This is one of the reasons I like for you to have a strong concordance. So what it does, it actually, if you see that word world, and it doesn't, and it's speaking of multi worlds, you better check it out. And most likely, instead of cosmos or erets or terra firma, it will be eon, which means time or age. Uh, Christine from Alabama, when the Antichrist comes, he is an angel. So when he's a cherubim, okay, may I correct you? So when he stands in the holy place, is he going to be born of a woman? Of course not. Um, uh, not certainly not as Jesus was. Okay, he's he is prideful. He would never give up his own body for anything. Okay, or some kind of a spirit. Now, will we be able to see him? Absolutely, he's going to claim to be Jesus Christ. That's why they call him instead of Christ, or as some would say, Antichrist. In Greek, it is instead of Christ. It means he comes first, claiming to be Christ. Is he going to be in the form of a human being? Of course, because that's we're made in their image. There's nothing new under the sun. That's why God would say, let us create man in our image. And he was talking about himself and the angels. Elihim, God and his children. Ernestine from Montana. Where in the Bible says that when we pass away, our body is and is instantly goes to the Lord? our spirit, not our body. Well, what do you think your spirit is? Your spirit is your intellect. And naturally, your intellect, God doesn't have any, by it alone, God doesn't want it, okay? Well, why? Because maybe your intellect is not all that sharp even, okay? Uh, God knows everything, you don't, okay? Your spirit is your intellect. Your spirit must travel even to have intellect with a soul. And your soul, I like, to, I like to translate it self in English because it kind of says it all. It is yourself regardless of what body you're in. Your soul is always the same. You may have more than one body, a flesh body and a spiritual body, but it's the same old soul rest in either one of them. And simply your soul's intellect, that's your thought process, 
um, must go with it. Why? Because it's, it is yourself. So you will find it in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 6 and 7. Michelle from, or you could go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 and 8, to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. Michelle from New Mexico, I don't understand free will. Well, the, you would have a difficult, a hard time understanding this earth age if you didn't understand free will. Because in the first earth age, Satan rebelled and a third of God's children followed him and turned against God. And God could have killed all of them or destroyed them. But have you ever thought about what it would take to kill one of your own children? That's what God was up against. So instead of killing his children, he killed the earth age, you might say. He ended that earth age and brought this one in. And there were many that stood with Christ in the first earth age. That's why you can read in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, God chose you before the foundations of this earth, meaning from the first earth age. Why? Because you stood against Satan then, and he can trust you. He knows you'll do it again. Therefore, uh, he has election, but most people have free will. Why? because God wants them to love him and not Satan. And many say, well, God can do whatever he wants to. God will never make someone love him. He will never force someone to love him. Why? That'd be fraud. That would be fake. It would not be love. You don't understand love if you don't understand free will. Because love can only originate within an entity and go outward from man to God, or vice versa, whatever the case may be. So that's why free will is here. God wants to know. He sent you a letter telling you what's going to happen, how it's going down, so that you could make your own mind up. Are you going to follow him, or are you going to go with the old slew food again? It's up to you. But he wants the real thing. You cannot force love. You cannot buy love. You cannot order love. Order Love must come from free will from within an entity. It, it, it can be a very difficult thing to understand unless you understand our Father, for He is the God of love. Uh, Margaret from Oregon, what book in the Bible is the Song of Moses? Where is it found? Deuteronomy chapter 32. You will find the title of the song in the last verse of Deuteronomy 31, uh, chapter 31. But it is the most beautiful song. Another place you can find it is Revelation chapter 15. You will find that those that have overcome the evil one and have are on their way to join Christ are singing that song, the song of Moses. So it's a very important song. It tells you about the creation of the children, how that God put boundaries on certain of them, and how some of them follow a different rock than our rock, meaning a different Christ than our Christ. It's quite simple when you know the truth. Deuteronomy 32. Uh, Linda from Florida. I, in Revelation 8, 13, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. Do you know what uh, maybe the three angels when they will sound and the meaning of yet to sound? Well, those are called the, war, the woe trumps. It has to do with Satan coming to earth. That's why they're woe trumps. And naturally, it's the last three because it is within that that he, he will come and um, he will um, try to deceive people, okay? Um, Revelation 17, 1, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many uh, waters. Um, who is the great whore that sitteth upon many waters? Well, keep reading down in chapter 17. He, he tells you, uh, he, he makes it very clear who that whore is, and the city, it's that great city Babylon, which means those that listen to Babel, 
and are deceived. They ride on the back of Satan's nation, his religion, because they're not intelligent enough to know, have read the Word of God to know the false Christ comes first. So you don't want to you don't want to get in his buggy. They're, they're going to think they're being raptured. Unfortunately, they're getting a false ride. But but if you'll continue on, it tells you that uh, that 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 horror is that great city. Okay, you'll you'll read it. Revelation chapter twenty one fourteen. And the wall of that city had twelve foundations, and in them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Are these the twelve apostles mentioned in Matthew 10, 2 and 4? If so, do you think Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed Jesus Christ, will be included? Well, that's not our right to decide, because we're not the judge. You know, when you read in first, um, the, the first chapter of the great book of Acts, you find out, um, what is it, along about the 18th verse, that uh, Judas, um, uh, in his hanging himself, was cut open from his Adam's apple all the way down past his belly button. All of his insides fell out. He had a lot of help committing suicide. Okay. And what did he do just before this happened? He repented. So you want to be real careful um, about making a judgment on who will be there. That, that's why we have our father. He's the judge. Dwayne from Oregon. I have had some serious health issues which resulted in me needing uh, pain meds. I was taking heroin and oxy, oxy, it says oxycontin here, but I know it's oxycontin. I have been off of them now for two years, but since I've gotten off of them, I've felt empty, scared, insecure. I don't understand why this is. I have accepted Christ as my Savior, yet my emptiness, loneliness re remains. Could this be a battle with Satan? You haven't really come all the way around, you know? And do you know what Satan's lining you up for? He knows your weakness. You kind of like that Oxycontin, don't you? Gives you a little buzz. You know, his spirit will give you a lot better buzz than that and you're useful then. Otherwise, you you're really don't amount to much, and you're going to be lonely, and you're going to be empty because you're not filled. When, when you break yourself away, and congratulations that you have, okay. Now, fill your tank with the Holy Spirit, with the Lord Jesus Christ, and know you have a purpose and a destiny, and you're going to fulfill it. God's going to deal with you till you do. You, you, you say you're lonely. God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Hebrews chapter 13. He will never leave you. So your loneliness just comes from not studying God's Word enough. So you need to get in there and you, you need to battle with Satan because he, he wants you. He'd like to take everybody to hell with him if he could. But you're too strong for that. I can say you're strong because two years you've stayed away. That's good. You're to be commended. Now fill yourself with fodder from the pasture, from, from God's own pasture, from the shepherd of all sheep. Know his voice and follow him. You'll do just fine. I, I want you to get a little tough on yourself, okay? Um, Practice discipline, um, and um, it's uh, it's very difficult. You know, as as um, as a marine, I love discipline. I, I love to know I can do whatever I want to with discipline and God's help. And you need um, to take on a little bit of the old marine. Just get a little tough on yourself and know you can cut it. You can always make another hill. So I, I want you to get a hold of your bootstraps and I want you to pull yourself up. And I want to see some action. I want to hear from you again. And I want to know you're doing well. <clears throat> Teresa and Jonathan from South Carolina. How do we rebuke evil? With Christ's name. You know, this is why Christ sent us the letter. Luke chapter 12, reading verse 18 and 19. Christ tells you, he said, hey, 
in the future, I beheld Satan fall from heaven as lightning. Okay, I mean, he's coming to earth. Satan is. But I give you power over all your enemies. That's all. A-L-L. -L, all your enemies. That includes the evil spirits, drugs, Satan, whomever. I give you power over all of them. <clears throat> Naturally, in his name. So that's how you do it. So I want both of you to re read uh, Luke 12, start with verse 9, 18 and 19, and know what's ahead and what, what you have going for you. We are so very fortunate that with a true mind in following him, we have the greatest weapon of all to defeat Satan. That's our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Catling from Catlin from Nevada. Um, does God all answer? Does God answer when you pray for others? Of course He does. It's called intercessory prayer. Let Him know you're making an intercessory prayer. It is your faith for that one, and ask on that behalf. And um, God appreciates uh, intercessory prayer. Donna from California, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 10. What does God mean when he says, because of the angels, women should cover their head? Cover their head with what? This is where many people make a mistake. That it's not hair, it's Christ. Why? Because of the angels. That's what it says. Why? Because the fallen angels, read Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 and 7 and 8. Not only Satan is being cast out on this earth, but his evil angels are cast out with him. And as Jesus would tell you in uh, Revel Matthew chapter 24, which we're going to get there before too long, that it's going to be just like in the days of Noah. They're going to be giving and taking in marriage to those fallen angels again, right here on earth. You know, they're coming. They refused to be born to woman, but they came to earth in Genesis 6 and seduced woman. And from that, we had Geber, which means giants, uh, um, hybrids, that was against God's own natural way. And so it was, okay? It's because of fallen angels. Be sure and go ahead and read. You're, you're talking about 11, uh, in the 11th chapter, 10th verse. Back back up to the 10th chapter, the 13th verse, and read it real well. In the 10th verse, it says, all those things happen like in Genesis as a lesson to us so that we would know what would befall us in the end times. And then in the 13th verse of that 10th chapter of 1 Corinthians, he says, hey, there's never anything going to happen to you that isn't pretty common to happening with everybody. And I will never test you over what you can handle. You can always cut it. But the last and best part of that 13th verse, I will always show you a way through. I will always show you a way out. You can believe that, for it is true. Okay, um, Mike, Mike from Pennsylvania. And uh, the Bible study, Unshakable gave me so much hope. Uh, that's a lecture I taught not too long ago. I'm very grateful for the Shepherd's Chapel. I am paranoid schizophrenia. My name doesn't work. My mind doesn't work right, but um, the medicine I take uh, for it lets me live a fairly normal life. Uh, if I remember right, Pastor Arnold Murray said that your name is part of your soul. Your mind is part of your soul. And in the CD, Mark of the Beast, Satan will put his mark in your mind and not going to let that happen. I'm not going to let that happen. Well, good for you. You hang tough. But what I want to know is when I die and get my spiritual body, will God fix my mind? He certainly will. And he'll eat with the medication. You know, Luke was a physician. Luke was a medical doctor. God sends good Christian medical doctors to assist and to help. So you keep praying about it, and, and God bless you. You're doing real good, okay? But um, in spiritual bodies, we, we have in these flesh bodies so much pollution in this world. There is, uh, but there are no, in spiritual bodies, there are no handicaps. And 
That's why that God will judge many in the millennium in the full spiritual body, whereby they, they know all things. And what they decide there is final. Vicki from Florida, I want to know what race the Kenites are. I would really clear, it would really clear my mind so for so many things. Well, what, what is the word Kenite? It's a Hebrew word. What is the definition? It's sons of Cain, the progeny of Cain. Now take your Strong's Concordance, check it out for yourself. The word Kenite is used many times, in, uh, several times in God's Word. It, it simply means the sons of children of Cain. Christ lets you know in, in Matthew, we'll be getting in Matthew chapter 13 soon, concerning the parable of the tares. They are the tares, and God, uh, Christ lets you know. When you get to verse 35, you'll say, hey, this is hidden since the foundation of the world from most people. But God sowed the good seed in the garden, and Satan came along and planted his little children. And, and, um, and, and he lets you know Christ teaching who the Kenites are. If you want something better from, from Christ, St. John chapter 8, verse 44, your father was the first murderer of the son of Cain, okay? Everybody knows who the first murderer was. They were the children of the devil. Christ's own teaching, I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word. And most of all, God loves you for it. It's his letter he sent to you. And he expects you to read it with understanding because it is your guidepost to eternity. So let him know you love him that's, and he'll love you right back. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. You bless God, he will always bless you. Most important though, you listen to me and you listen good now. You stay in his word every day. In his word is a good day. You know why? Even with trouble, it's a good day because Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.